what they did. You don't have to tell me. Line. Okay, this is working, I think, right? Okay, I can hear myself now. Welcome, everybody that's here this evening. It's a nice night out, and thank you for watching online also. We're going to give a few announcements before we start, and like we normally do, and then I'll bore you a little bit with a uh, devotion. Okay, here's our announcements. George Basher had surgery to remove his gallbladder yesterday. He remains in Hutchinson Regional Medical Center. I did go to see him this afternoon. He's hoping to get out tomorrow afternoon sometime. Looks like he might. John Lowen is also in the Hutchinson Regional Medical Center, room 3302, following partial hip replacement. And guess what? Those two are side by side in the hospital. One, and one of them didn't even know the other one was over there. <laughs> so that's kind of unique. I got to see them both today. And uh, John was feeling a lot better this, this afternoon than he was this morning. Word was this morning he had a bad morning, so to stay away. But I couldn't go to that one side and not go over there and peek my head in the other one. So I had to do it, but they were happy. That was okay. But they're both doing okay. He's going to have another 12 to 14 days probably of rehab before he gets out. Lloyd Schmidt received a good report from his heart cath. Looks like he had some blockage, but right now they're not going to do anything with it because they, he's still in the same state he was the last time he had it checked. Neil Schmidtberger went home from the hospital last night, and we'll find out about more of that in the morning when he comes to men's class. Tammy Warrington could use her prayers as she has suffered a slight stroke. Michelle Schmucker would appreciate your count, uh, continued prayers as she will have see a specialist in Kansas City on Monday for her eye. All of you know that she's ha been having trouble with her eye, and, and that's something that got to be sent clear to Kansas City to, have, to see a specialist, but she says, hey, whatever it takes, right? We don't want some rookie doing it. Well, soup kitchen is this coming Tuesdays. Still needed is this. One meal in one, four dozen cookies or brownies, one case of water, and servers. Sign up by the supply room if you'd like to help with this. Brett McCaslin will be here in Hutchison this coming Tuesday through Thursday. He will be at the Geezer Luncheon at Gambino's in South Hutchison on Wednesday. That'll be at noon if you want to go hear him talk about uh, his mission. He will bring us an update on Wednesday evening in the auditorium. That's one week from tonight. And, and then uh, have the lesson at men's Bible study on Thursday. Plan to be there if you'd want. Now, this is my fault, I believe, but if you read the bulletin that came out today, it says we're having Brett McCaslin in the fellowship hall. Disregard that stupid announcement. It's not true. It's in here. It's going to be in here. Okay. Carpenter Place will pick up the groceries October the 14th. A needs list is posted on the mission bo a bulletin board in the south hallway. Also, for those of you that knew the Mullen family, Jim Mullins passed away yesterday. So I know some of you probably know him or knew that family, uh, but he passed away. That's all the details we have on that at this point in time. Let's go to our Father in prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you for watching over us. We thank you for being our God. We thank you for listening to our requests and our petitions when we ask and talk to you. But we especially praise your name for being who you are. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for the church that he died for. And we're just so happy that we can be a part of that church and that kingdom. Father, we thank you for the forgiveness of sins that he provides for us. We thank you, Father, for loving us the way you do and giving us all the blessings that, that you bestow upon us. And we just don't deserve really any of them, but help us always to be grateful for them and remember to thank you for them. And Father, we just ask your prayers upon these sick people and these people that are in the hospital that we've just mentioned, that you would help mend them if you would, please and aid them in any way you can, and we will surely do the same. Thank you, Father, for the classes we have this evening and this coming Sunday. We thank you for the teachers. We thank you for everybody that's sitting in these pews and in the classrooms to want to learn more about what you have to say through this great book. We thank you for it. We thank you for the inspiration it gives to us as we read it. We pray that we would learn many things because we're going to look at it tonight. In Jesus' name. Some of you might know that I've been working on a deck in my backyard for a little over a year, okay? 
Now, the announcement is the deck's done. Because I've, you know how many quick times I've been asked that question? A lot of times. Every time I come to come over here to church, you got your deck done yet? No, I don't have the deck done yet. I said, I only have basically Saturday to work on it. And then when I'm out there working on a Saturday, if one of you all call me and need me, I got to go. So that's just the way this kind of a job is. But it's okay. I like this kind of a job. But that doesn't allow me to work on it 40 hours a week like I was a carpenter working for somebody else. So therefore, the debt got done a little bit at a time. And that brings me this story. When Betty Keeler was still alive, three, three doors down from me, she was my neighbor. And she would come over and want me to walk with her once in a while. I, I told her, I said, I'll reserve Saturday nights for you, Betty. And the rest of the time, I have things to do. And uh, she understood that, so that's what we did. But about every three or four days, she would come over while I was building that deck. She wanted to look at my progress. After about three trips, I said, are you going to look at my deck tonight? She says, no, every time I look at it, you haven't done anything. <laughs> I said, okay, Daddy, here's the deal. When you, I'm going to tell you. When she was looking at it from time to time, every three or four or five days, I was still doing the framework on it. I was still putting the tuba eights in. I was putting them in the, in the uh, hangers. I was putting the bracing in. I was making sure everything was perfect and right before I did the last step, which was put in the, the two by sixes for the decking. So she doesn't live long enough to see all that or we were gonna have coffee on my deck when I was finished, okay? So what I'm getting at is this. Sometimes we work on something that cannot be seen all the time. Like a carpenter knows what needs to be done before the finished part is put on, but usually most people don't understand what those things are. They think they haven't done anything, okay? But certainly I've been working on it, but you just can't tell because you didn't know exactly what to look for, right? Us as people sometimes, we are working on something from the inside out sometimes, and people can't locate and they can't realize what's going on in our hearts and our mind. But the Lord is helping us out. We sing the little song once in a while. I used to sing it at camp, and I don't, I've never heard it around here much, but there was a song called, The Lord is Still Working on Me. Now, I don't know exactly know how that goes, but I know that's the name of it. But I think until we get to heaven, the Lord is still going to be working on me because he knows that I need him each and every step that I take every day. You know, when James gives that little thought process over in his book in, in chapter 1 about consider it a joy, my brethren, when trials and tribulations come your way, because if you will endure, another word for endure in some of these passages is if you will have patience, it will help you out. Basically, it's going to help you out in your life. So. I want to go over here for just a moment and read a couple of scriptures for you. In Hebrews chapter 6, <clears throat> verses 14 and 15 says this, and it's talking about Mr. Abraham, saying, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply you, and thus having patiently, there's our word, having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. Now he made that promise to Abraham 25 years later, Isaac shows up. He had to wait 25 years to get that promise, but he waited. We don't know what he was thinking during that time, but I know that he was wondering, well, I know that God's going to give me that promise at some point in time, and it happened, didn't it? That was him. What about us today? What does he promise us today? Still staying in the book of Hebrews, let's go over to chapter 10, verses 35 and 36 says this. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance. Some of your copies might say patience. You have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. I'm believing, I'm thinking that, you know, when you're 25, you probably have less patience than you do when you're 75. Just because we look back on our lives, if we're 75 in that area, we're thinking, yeah, I've learned a lot of things just by going through those trials and tribulations that James talked to us about. I've learned a lot of things. But when you're 25, you're not there yet. You've got a long way to go to learn all that stuff. So therefore, you're a little bit more impatient. Those of you with teenage kids or those of you that have kids in their 20s, I think you would probably agree with me on that, wouldn't you? So let's look at it this way. 
Let's go back to Betty for just a minute. When she came over, she was looking at the deck and it wasn't done yet. She, was, she didn't understand what had to be done to get all those things done. So she was looking at it thinking, this ought to be done by now. Well, I was still working on it, just like God's still working on me. You know, but she did have what verses 36 had. For you, uh, 35 and 36, therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. She was confident of her reward that she was going to get because of the endurance that she had in life. She had that kind of patience. She had that kind of endurance, even though she didn't know it exactly understand what I was doing with my deck. So for, for you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, which I'm sure Betty did, we all knew her, you may receive what was promised. We're going to get eternal home. We're going to get what's promised to us also because if we just endure and have patience, you know, we read all through this book, Old Testament book especially, the patience of Job, we just read about the patience of Abraham a little bit. We read about uh, different kinds of patience. We read about the patience of, Noah, of God when Noah was building the ark. All kinds of patience takes place. And it takes time for some of these things to, to, to fulfill itself. The older we get, the more patience I believe we get because We've experienced more things in life that teaches us a lesson. And I think those are things that we, when we, when we are senior citizens, I'll call us that, we understand that now. We understand that now. So one of these days, when I pass away, I don't know when that might be, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to that McDonald's in heaven that I know that Betty liked to go to while she was here, and I'm going to get us both a cup of coffee. And I'm going to go to her mansion, and we're going to sit at her dining room window and look out the picture window at those streets paved with gold, and we're just going to have a merry old time. That's what's going to happen. Okay. So, but right now, Mr. Wayne is going to sing us a song, and then check this out. He's going to tell us why Moses doesn't drink instant tea. I had to think about that one for a second here. Oh, my. Hey, it's good to be with you here this evening. Let's sing. Actually, I talked to the teacher tonight. He said, you could go ahead and do two songs here this evening. So how about number 613? 613, we're going to do first and third, and then we'll do one more. We've got uh, plenty of time for that. And if you kind of notice, um, these songs will have something to do with the, uh, the book of Hebrews. Book of Hebrews, 613 is hold to God's unchanging hand. Time is filled with swift transition. Not on earth a move can stand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. When your journey is completed, if to God you have been true, fair and bright the home in glory, your enraptured soul will be. God's unchanging hand, hold to God's unchanging hand, build your hopes on things eternal, hold to God's unchanging hand. All right, now how about 467, 467, we have an anchor. Mm -hmm. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life when the clouds unfold their wings of strife? When the strong tides slip and the cable strain, will your anchor drift or firm remain? We have an anchor. 
anchor that keeps us so steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. When our eyes behold through the gathering night the city of gold harbor bright, we shall anchor fast by the heavenly shore with the storms all past forevermore. We have an anchor that keeps us so steadfast and sure while the billows roll, fastened to the rock which cannot move, rounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. Amen. Thank you for singing along here tonight. All right. How is everybody doing? Everybody doing okay? Good to be with you. I know we're kind of battered and bruised over here, just seeing some of our folks here tonight that have made it, some that are in the hospital. Uh, many are traveling, and so a lot of folks on our hearts and minds, but we're very thankful for you being here tonight. Very thankful for those that are watching online as well. We are continuing with our survey of the New Testament books. We're really getting close uh, to the end now. Now we come to the wonderful book of Hebrews. Perhaps one of my all-time favorite New Testament books. Now, one thing we're going to discover about Hebrews, it's quite different from most of the other New Testament books. For example, one of the books that we studied last week was the, the, the epistle or the letter to Philemon. Now, I want you to see how Philemon starts out, and I want you to see how the book of Hebrews begins. And notice the difference or the contrast there. All right? Philemon, a very, very familiar start. Here's how Paul oftentimes started his letters. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, and to Philemon, our dear beloved and fellow laborer, and to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. So, sounds very familiar. We've seen that pattern many times. Now, start with me in Hebrews chapter 1. God who at sundry times and in diverse manners speak in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he has also made the worlds. Now, what did you notice was different about Philemon and, uh, and the book of Hebrews? What did you catch there? Yeah, it really isn't pointed out, hey, this is Philemon, here's Titus, here's Timothy to the Romans. That's the way he's traditionally going to do it. And it's more like, some have said, it, it's kind of like the starting of speech, chapter 1. Then you move to chapters 2 through 11. It sounds a lot more like a sermon. One of my favorite Old Testament books is actually a sermon, Ecclesiastes. It's a beautiful sermon. And so as you study through the book of Hebrews, it really flows like how a sermon, as the preacher would be making different points and illustrations along the way. That's the book of Hebrews. But then when you get to the very end, all of a sudden it's sounding a whole lot like some of these traditional New Testament letters with these kind of final greetings and these salutations and identifying different people. So it has three different movements in it. Chapters 1, chapters 2 through 11, and then ending uh, like a traditional letter, verses 12 and 13. Now, something else that is different is that no one exactly knows who the author of Hebrews is. Now, in some of your studies, what, who have you heard has been a, a possible author of the book of Hebrews? That's why we often say, for example, if we're teaching a class or preaching a sermon, the author of the book of Hebrews, because it's not identified. But who have you heard? All right, I've heard Paul speak out. This is a big old room to try to fill. Alex believes it's Barnabas. All right, Alex, uh, what was Alex's last name? Alex Humphrey. Uh, yeah, Alex Humphrey thought it was uh, Barnabas, that son of encouragement. Uh huh, sure, sure. All right, so Paul, Barnabas, anybody else? 
Apollos has been, you know, and why m might Apollos be a good candidate, Alan? Okay. Hey, that's a fair assessment, you know. <laughs> very articulate, but it said that he was well versed in the scripture. And as you go through the book of, uh, of Hebrews, I mean, he just goes on and on, quoting all kinds of different Old Testament passages of scripture. But uh, Apollos is a very viable candidate. Now, ultimately, you know, one of the, the early Christian writers, a guy by the name of Origen, he said, who the author of this epistle is, only God knows. And that's true. So, only God knows. But, you know, it's traditionally attributed to Paul. And I think there's a lot of evidence, perhaps, for that being the case. Number one. Uh, there's really no proof that it was anybody else because, again, no, no particular person is mentioned. Uh, Paul is mentioned by several second century uh, writers as being the author of uh, the book of Hebrews. Um, turn with me to the very end of the book, chapter 13. Chapter 13, as he's kind of giving those salutations at the end of it. Let's pick it up in chapter 13, verse 22. And I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation. All right, so he's referring to this letter as a word of exhortation or a word of, what does your version say? Encouragement, perhaps? It's a word of encouragement. This was meant to encourage them. For I've written a letter unto you in a few words. Know you that our brother Timothy, so the author knew who Timothy was, is set at liberty, with whom, if he comes shortly, I will see you. Salute all of them that have this rule over you, and all of the saints. They of Italy, most of your versions do say Rome, um, salute you. Grace be with you all. Amen. Uh, the actual word is Italia. And so uh, Italy, uh, Rome would be synonymous with Italy. So this is somebody that knows Timothy, somebody that's in Rome or Italy, and then uh, I believe it's chapter number 10, just thinking off the top of my head here. Uh, yes, verse 34, for you had compassion on me and my bonds. And so here was somebody that had been imprisoned. Who do you know was really close to Timothy and had spent time in prison in Rome? Paul. Would have, all right? So there's a lot of evidence for Paul as being the author. And then even in the letter of 2 Peter, when Peter's writing about, hey, some of Paul's letters are difficult to understand and, and some people have misapplied and misinterpreted them. And he talks about a letter that had been written. And so there's some other letter, general uh, apostolic letter that Paul had written that the similar audience that 1 Peter and 2 Peter is addressed to, um, there, most scholars think that that is a reference to the book of Hebrews. And so for you to say, well, I really kind of am persuaded that Paul is, that's a very viable solution. But ultimately, since the author does not identify who they are, we have to put it in God's hands, only God truly knows. But I think you're gonna be very, very impressed as we make our way through this book. So, first of all, let's go back to chapter number one. Did I hear something? Oh, yeah, Brother Kwong. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Now, uh, higher textual criticism says this is a different kind of Greek than Paul would generally write. And so that's why some have said that Paul wrote it but let's say Luke was his scribe, or Apollos was his scribe, or perhaps even Barnabas, somebody that would be very, very familiar with the Greek language, writing at a higher style with Paul dictating that, and then they're kind of putting it maybe in some of the, the language they would be familiar with. Um, but I've always countered that to say, you know what, uh, going through my academic career, there was different writing styles that I would use. If I was writing poetry, that was very different than if I was writing uh, maybe something for a political science class or something for a biology class. 
And so it would not surprise me at all if Paul said, hey, I want to do a different approach in this letter to the Hebrews. And so the idea of, well, it's a little more of a classic style of Greek writing, therefore it couldn't be the Apostle Paul, I, I feel it's a very weak argument on that. But many have suggested it has Paul's feel to it, but perhaps the, the actual scribe might have been somebody like Luke or Apollos that could have uh, dictated that down for him or had written it down for him, okay? Appreciate that thought, Qual. All right, now we are back to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, could I get a volunteer reader to do the first three verses? First three verses of Hebrews chapter 1. All right, so now I'm going to go to this next slide. Let's go ahead and advance that, if you would, crew. Um, just showing um, the superiority of Christ. So if we could kind of break it down, what is that one theme that Hebrews is all about? I believe that this author of the book of Hebrews would want to say Christ is superior. How is he superior? Chapter 1, 1 through 3, he's the heir of all things. He's the creator. He's made the world. He is the brightness of God's glory. In fact, he's the express image in the original language icon. Just like we have icons on our computer screens, Jesus is the icon of the Heavenly Father. He has purged our sins or he's provided purification for sins. He sat down at the right hand of God. Here is an excellent passage that explains the deity of Christ. Can you think of another New Testament passage that, that really focuses on the deity, the God-likeness of Jesus Christ. Can you think of, just off the top of your head, John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, all right? So John 1, Hebrews 1, Colossians chapter 1 does that as well. It's easy to remember, Brother Qua likes to have little mnemonics. Hebrews 1, Colossians 1, uh, there, uh, that we're talking about, uh, John chapter 1, and then Philippians chapter 2 talks about the deity of Jesus. So you got 1 and 2 to try to be able to remember that. Now, let's do, uh, go ahead and we're going to read uh, verse 4 through the end of chapter 1. And now the, the, this writer is going to make a point, not only is he a superior person, He's the, uh, you know, he, he's uh, divine, but look at how he is superior to angels, to angels. Verse 4, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by the inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten of the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. And all of the angels, he said, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers flames of fire. But unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax or grow old, as, do as doth a garment. And as a vesture shall they fold up them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels say he at any time, sit at my right hand until thine enemies be thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? So let's look at that here real fast. So Jesus is greater than angels. And he uses seven scripture quotations. 
And many of your Bibles have these as little footnotes. Well, verse 5 is a direct reference to Psalm 2.7. Verse 5 also talks seven, uh, 2 Samuel 7.14. So, seven, that's interesting. Seven characteristics of Jesus' deity. Seven um, proof texts to show that Jesus is more important than angels. Why use seven? Why, why do you think it was important for this very wise author to be able to use these very convincing persuasions as he begins this inspired speech. Why seven quotations? Why seven references to the deity of Jesus? That's the perfect number, isn't it? Break it down. Four, the number of man. Three, the number of God. Put those together, that's perfection, that's completeness. So he's like, here is a complete argument here. Here's the deity of Jesus. I'm gonna show you throughout the entirety of this book, this little simple exhortation, this encouragement. All right, now, he's deity. Number two, he is greater than angels. Well, how? How, author, is he greater than angels? Well, he's inherited a name more excellent than angels. What was that name? Did you pick it up? He, angels just means messengers or servants there. He has a name of what? Hello, real loud. Did you catch the name? Look at this. He's God's son. They are just messengers. He has a name. He's the son. He's that divine son. He's the son of God. He's also the son of man. That's his messianic name because that's the incarnation, that God became flesh. All right? So he's that son. They are just angels. Um, all the angels of God, in fact, worship him, verse 6 says, and he sits at the right hand of God. But then verse 14 at the end there, um, what has he said is the, is the main job for angels? What do they do? What's one of their primary purposes? Are not all angels what? Ministering spirits. So they're servants to serve. Who, who are they serving? <laughs> Those that will inherit eternal life, us. All right, so that's kind of their main job is to serve us. They worship him. And we see that in the book of Revelation, don't we? So, wow, what a convincing argument. Jesus is far superior than angels. All right, then we go to chapter 2. This we'll just go ahead and read. Here's a warning that he has. All right, so he's got your attention with chapter 1. Now let's give them a warning or an admonition. Start with me in verse 1. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, there's angels again, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak. All right? So he's talking about if this message that was delivered by angels had severe consequences for those that disobeyed this one, how much more will there be consequences for those that abandon this new message, this new word? All right, now in Acts chapter 7, I believe it was in Stephen's speech, he talked about how the law, remember over there on Mount Sinai when Moses was getting the Ten Commandments and all the other commandments and stuff, somehow angels were involved in giving him that revelation. God was speaking, but somehow they were involved in that. Acts chapter 7, verse 53. So the Hebrew writers make an allusion to this. Okay, if this law, this covenant, had such great consequences, if you didn't follow it, how much more this message from God's Son, if we reject it or turn our back on it? Um, it was given by Jesus. It was given to those who had heard him. That would be the apostles. How did they uh, show it to be true? By the signs and wonders and the miracles and the gifts of the Holy Ghost that accompanied um, the, uh, the, the transmission of it. That's chapter 2. Chapter number 3, he's going to take a little time to show that 
Jesus is superior to Moses. How do you feel that the average Israelite or, or, or Jew would feel about Moses? As they look upon the importance of Moses in their nation's history. How do you think they felt about Moses? Yeah, that he would be faithful. Faithful for what, Cynthia? How, how was Moses faithful? Sacred, yes. And, and why sacred? What, what made him special to them? Yes, that's right. That here was that, that leader for them for 40 years. Here's the one that, that went up into the presence of God, that received the Ten Commandments from God, that performed all these miracles, this great prophet that they were to follow after, who would be greater in their mind, in their estimate, than Moses. But look at how the writer shows it. Jesus is even superior to Moses. Look here in the verse, few verses of chapter 3. Verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle, the high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him um, that appointed him as also Moses was faithful in all of his house, for this man was counted worthy of much more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that build all things is God. Moses was very, verily faithful in all of his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken uh, up after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if, here's the condition, we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm until the end. All right? Just as someone builds a house, whoever that architect is or builder of that house is greater than the house. Anybody ever heard of Frank Lloyd Wright? Frank Lloyd Wright, okay? Very, very famous architect. Now, we can kind of remember some of his houses, but where's the honor? Where's the glory? Where's the esteem to the architect? And so just as Moses ought to be acknowledged, recognized, he was faithful to God, but he was just a servant of God. Jesus, Jesus is the son of God. All right? So Jesus is superior than Moses. Son, servant. Chapter number four. Chapter number four, he reminds them of a rest that was promised during Joshua's days. For the people, as they were going into the promised land, as they were going into the promised land there, um, and there is another rest that God's people look forward to. Somebody read for us here tonight. How about chapter four, verses eight through 11? Hebrews chapter four, eight through 11 now. Not all at once, please. For Joshua had given the rest. Uh huh. Not to go later at their head. There remained for him that rest which he had got. For in 20 years God's rest all the rest of the people. Just as God did for Moses. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one should perish by falling from the command. All right, perfect. Okay. Because not all in that generation was able to experience that rest. Not all of them made it into the promised land. Those that were 20 years and older, they died out in the desert. So Joshua was leading the people into this land. This land flowing of milk and honey, that was kind of restful for them. But that wasn't the final rest that God's people are looking forward to. No, we're looking for an eternal rest, a Sabbath rest. And isn't that a beautiful picture of heaven, that we're going to have a place of rest. As hard as we work and labor and, and toil, as much as our body feels the, 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 the strife and the, and the pain of that toil, well, one of these days we're going to enter into a rest. But here's the condition. Let us labor, verse 11, to enter that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. 
here is that key theme of, of, of the book of Hebrews. Not only is Jesus superior, but we're going to get into it in chapter 10. The just shall live by faith. Just as Paul talked about in Galatians, the just shall live by faith. Just as he talked in Romans, the just shall live by faith. To be just, to be right with God, we must believe in God. We must have um, works that demonstrate that faith and that belief. And we'll get to that when we get to chapter number 11. So that's chapter 4, was the warning about stay faithful, continue in your belief so that you can enter into God's forever rest. Now as we move into chapters 5, 6, and 7, we're going to be introduced to an interesting priest. An interesting priest. Go with me to chapter 7 and verse number 1. Chapter 7, verse 1. And we uh, discover who that is. A guy by the name of Melchizedek. Melchizedek. Listen to this. Verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, being first, uh, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, after that also king of Salem, which means king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like until the Son of God abideth a priest continually. Okay, where have we heard about this Melchizedek before? All the way back in the Old Testament. Again, this writer of the book of Hebrews is making a very liberal usage of, of the audience knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures. Where have we heard about Melchizedek before? Only actually has a couple references in the entirety of the entire Old Testament. All the way back to Genesis. What else, Bill? Back to Abraham. Now, why did Abraham give him a tenth? What was going on? Do you remember? Some kind of battle happened. Yeah, uh-huh. Remember, Abraham had a, a nephew named, a little short one here, Lot, all right? Lot had been carried off. Remember, he, he, uh, he kind of pitched his tent down towards Sodom, and next thing you know, he's over there living in Sodom. And so he gets swept up by this coalition of kings led by King Ketelammer that's just annihilating all the people living there, uh, coming down of, of the Dead Sea and moving into the Promised Land. Abraham was a guy not to be messed with. And you can read about this in Genesis chapter 14. And so Abraham defeats him, and as he's bringing Lot and all the possessions back and stuff, here comes this priest, but he's an unusual priest because he's a king and he's a priest. A king and a priest comes out to meet Abraham. Abraham gives him a tenth of all these spoils. So... Melchizedek is of greater importance than Abraham, the founder of the Israelite people. Yes, Moses was very, very important as that, that great prophet, but now we're talking Father Abraham, the father of the believing, the father of the faithful, and he looks up to Melchizedek, this priest king. All right, well, what do we know about Melchizedek? Verse 1 through 3. Without father or mother, having neither beginning of days, that would be his birth, nor end of days, he talks about there. Now, this really throws some folks into some confusion to say, okay, how does this person not die? And you think about those that didn't die in the scriptures. You have Enoch, God took him away. You had Elijah, he went to heaven in a whirlwind. And perhaps we're talking about Melchizedek. He had no beginning of day nor end of day. So who in the world would this Melchizedek be then? Somebody that wasn't born and didn't die? <laughs> I can see the gears turning now here. You're like, what in the world? Who is this Melchizedek? All right, I'm going to keep it real, real simple here for us. One is he could be an early incarnation of Christ, and it's called a Christophany. Sometimes God would come down in the Old Testament and he would be, you know, look like a, a, a person. And you see that uh, in a visitation to Abraham. That would be called a theophany, um, kind of a visitation of God. Some say that Melchizedek was a, a, a Christophany, that uh, he came and for that period of time made an appearance. 
That's a possibility. However, the vast majority of uh, uh, scholars say that's not the point that's really being made here. The writer of the book of Hebrews is trying to identify, okay, Jesus' priesthood is superior to the Levitical priesthood. Those that are descendants of Aaron, the Levites, those are the only people that could be the high priest and, and, and serve as priests in the tabernacle and the temple. Jesus was from the tribe of what? Was it Reuben, Simeon, Levi? Judah. 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 All right. So Jesus technically couldn't be part of that order of priests since he was from the tribe of Judah. You would have to come from the tribe of Levi. But who does Jesus identify? He identifies with the order, the priestly order of Melchizedek. And as you read about him in scripture, we don't have anything that talks about his birth. We don't have anything that talks about his death. It's just this little small synopsis in scripture. And so he has like a perpetual uh, priesthood. His priesthood just went on and on uh, without stopping there. And so the Messiah, Psalm 110 talks about, will come from the order of Melchizedek. And that was Jesus. Not saying that Melchizedek didn't have a parent, because he probably obviously did have parents. Jesus had parents. And obviously he would have died at some time. That's not the point that he was trying to make. He's saying Jesus' priesthood is like Melchizedek's. It's kind of left open because it's not come to a close. It's not associated with genealogy like the Levitical priesthood would have to be. I know that's kind of some heavy stuff. Think about it. Go back and read it again. His big point is Jesus' high priestly ministry is above the Levitical, the Jewish ministry. Some of you are being tempted to abandon your Christian belief. Go back to your Hebrew, your Israelite roots. Why would you do that? Jesus is greater than Joshua. Jesus is greater than Moses. He is greater than Abraham. He's greater than, uh, uh, he's part of that priesthood order just like Melchizedek, okay? That's the point that he's trying to make. Now, in chapters 8, 9, and 10, he starts talking about he starts talking about how Jesus' sacrifice, how Jesus' sacrifice fulfilled the different types that you saw in the law of Moses. Let me go to chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. Look at this. Now, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. Here's the summary of it. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched, and not a man. For every priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it's of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law who serve unto the example and shadow of the heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith the, that thou make all these things according to the pattern, the pattern that showed to thee in the mount. And now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises." All right, now, oh, I think it's been about a year and a half, maybe two years ago, I had a special Wednesday night class, and we studied all about the intricacies of the, of the tabernacle. What did all the different colors mean? What was this holy place? What was this Ark of the Covenant? What did all these different sacrifices mean? Okay, so let's talk about type and antitype. Type and antitype. Now, Many of you in here are familiar with typewriters, correct? Typewriters. We go all the way back to the electric typewriting days. And wasn't that kind of fun? My mom, actually, my grandmother, um, she actually had one of those old standard typewriters, you know, that without, I mean, you had to really bear down on those keys. Well, 
Whenever you would strike a key, that thing would go out and leave an image on that paper. Bang, just strike. You know, now we do it with our little electronic stuff. Same principle, but that's the type, and the anti-type is the image that's left over there. So a lot of these things, well, these things that we were written about in the Old Testament under the law, about the Passover, about the tabernacle, about the temple, those all had to be made according to a pattern. Where did this pattern come from? Did he say there, here in chapter 8? Because Moses was not supposed to deviate from this pattern. It came from God. Yes, it was a, it was a shadow. It was a type of a greater reality. And so just as the sanctuary and priests and all of that kind of stuff, they are those types, they are the shadows, of a greater reality of the sanctuary in heaven. Jesus is our high priest. All those sacrifices, day of atonement, Passover, all of those are fulfilled in Jesus. I like how some teachers explain it this way. If you ever go out to the airport, we used to live over there by Apple Lane, and as airplanes were flying over, oftentimes we would see their shadow before the airplane came. And so the kids would know, hey, okay, here comes a jet that's coming in to, to land over here. The shadow wasn't the reality. It was a reflection that the reality was coming. And so as we read about these priests, as we read about the tabernacle and the temple and all these different festivals that they would do under the Old Testament law, it was preparing the people for a greater reality that was going to be fulfilled in Jesus. And so that's what the author of Hebrews is arguing to say, hey, you guys are going back to shadow. You're going back to the figures and the types. The ultimate reality is found in, in the Son of God, in the Son of Man, Jesus. Why would you abandon that, the greater, the reality, for something that was a shadow and a type? That's the argument that he's making in, in 8, uh, 9, and 10. Uh, let's look here. In chapter 10, I'm just going to summarize this because our time, that can't be right. Ten minutes before, um, our time is filled with swift transition, okay? All right. So uh, Hebrews 8, 1 through 3, Jesus is the right hand of God, the true tabernacle. He offered the final sacrifice, that earthly sacrifice is only foreshadowed. They were just types. Verses 1 through 4, Old Testament sacrifices were never enough because the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. Verses 5 to 10, Christ's sacrifice is the only one that can make us holy. And then verses 11 through 18, through Christ's sacrifice, our sins are forgiven. There's no longer any need for the sacrifice of sin. All right? Again, one of the great themes of the book of Hebrews is by faith. And then you come to chapter 11. Chapter 11. Verse 1, now faith is, here's what it is, it is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Well, how important is faith? We come down here to verse number 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him or to please God, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he uh, is a rewarder of them that diligently seek after him. And so what do they call oftentimes Hebrews chapter 11? This is a very familiar chapter for all of us. Hebrews chapter 11 is the hall of fame of what? Of faith. That's right. That's right. So we're going to see people like uh, Noah and Abraham and Sarah and uh, Moses, and they'll just teach example after example of people that were of great faith. And so Noah... How did he show his, faith? show his faith? He prepared an ark. Now, I was talking to somebody earlier today that had, how many of you guys have been out to that ark in Tennessee? All right, several hands. Is that pretty impressive to see that? Wow, all right. I just found another article about a week ago. Of, uh, it was talking about Raiders of the Lost Ark that uh, over in Turkey, there's been a, a, a site, an archaeological site, that they have been studying since the late 1950s when a, an aerial uh, a guy, uh, 
Um, an Air Force officer in the, in the Turkish army was flying around uh, doing reconnaissance and he's like, that's the strangest, that looks like a ship over there on top of that mountain. And so they have been studying this for years and years, especially during the 70s and 90s. And, and when I was in the school of preaching at sunset, one of my instructors had went over there with this guy, this explorer by the name of Ron Wyatt, and he had discovered eight of the largest ancient um, anchors, sea anchors, found in that area. And it's like, why would a sea anchor be at 6,500 feet up in the mountains there? And there's all kinds of amazing discoveries, but something that just came out in the last month or two, as they're using all this fancy imagery and sonar and all that kind of stuff, instead of just finding mud and rocks like you normally would find in a natural formation, there's all kinds of 90 degree angles. There's like beams that are in there. And so now they're gonna explore that further. So perhaps there's another evidence of Noah's Ark that's waiting to be discovered at just the right time. So I wanted to share that with you. But then of course Moses was, was faithful as uh, he refused to be called Pharaoh's son. He chose to suffer with the children of God. He left Egypt not fearing Pharaoh um, and passed through the Red Sea. And so fear is the opposite of faith that we've talked about. All right, so our final verse there is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Let's read that. Wherefore, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Let us run with patience. Steve talked about patience tonight. The race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher, here's that theme for Hebrews, of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and sat down, uh, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. My final thing that I would like to uh, share here is just like Malachi was kind of that final message to the Israelite people before the coming of the Messiah. So the, the book of, New, of, of, of Hebrews in the New Testament, this letter to the Hebrews is the final word uh, to the Israelite nation that the Messiah has come. Malachi, he's coming, and this is a reminder that he has come. We didn't have the time to kind of develop it here tonight, but to say, when was the book of Hebrews kind of written as you put things together? Obviously, it, it appears to be written before the fall of Jerusalem. When did that happen? AD what? AD 70. AD 70. And let me read, we, we've got two or three minutes here, how terrible that was. Oftentimes we, we forget how terrible the fall of Jerusalem was. The Jewish wars and the revolt against Rome began in about AD 66. Titus, uh, with his Roman army, arrived before the walls of Jerusalem on the day of Passover in AD 70. Banks of earthenwork were built, battering rams were placed, and the siege began. The Roman army numbered 30,000, the Jewish army 24,000. The city was crowded with 600,000 visitors, according to Tacitus. But after five months, the walls were battered down, the temple was burned, the city was left ruined and desolate, except Herod's three great towers at the northwest corner, which were left standing as a memorial of the massive strength of the fortifications which Titus had demolished. The Roman army moved down to Caesarea and over one million Jews were killed. 95,000 captives were taken. Among them was even the Jewish historian Josephus. So a terrible slaughter came against the people of Israel in AD 70, especially against the city of Jerusalem. And so whenever you read passages in Hebrews, you know, not uh, forsaking the, your assembling uh, yourselves together um, and you're looking forward um, to a, a certain date, you know, at first, you know, that was oftentimes used to say, hey, you're not being faithful to assembly. But as you kind of put that into context, it sounds like something else is, is on, on the work there. Um, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day 
approaching. The day approaching. There was a day of great judgment that was approaching these people. And so a lot here in the book of Hebrews said, stay faithful. And the Christians who were familiar with Jesus' teaching, hey, when you see these Gentile armies come against Jerusalem, that's time to flee, and that's when they went down to Pella. So they avoided that great persecution and that great slaughter while the Jews stayed there. And so that day was approaching then. That is the book of Hebrews. I know we covered a lot of ground, but a beautiful, beautiful book. Now next week we're going to take a little break because who's going to be with us? Brett. McCaslin's going to be here and talk about Keys of the Kingdom, so it's always awesome when Brett is here. But then we'll, we'll jump into that wonderful, uh, mature book of faith, the, the book of James. Only five chapters that we'll have to uh, peruse through in two weeks from tonight. But let's end with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this amazing time to be able to study your word. Father, as we, we delve into it, as we look at it, it's just so brilliant uh, the way that it's laid out father as we've studied the book of hebrews and father what a very serious reminder we have had that we need to maintain our faith that it's so easy to be tempted to drift especially when times are hard when it's difficult and perhaps we even uh, experience persecution for our faith but father let's be like people like sarah and, and noah and moses and be faithful Let's be part of that, that, that great crowd that uh, encompasses, uh, Father, the, the people of God as we look unto your son Jesus and his example. And, Father, that nothing would be more important in our life than our relationship with him and being faithful to the very point of our death, to the very end of our life. Thank you again for this opportunity to be with us, uh, be together here tonight, and we look forward uh, when we can gather once again. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. All right, everyone, have a wonderful evening. Thank you, those that have been watching online tonight as well.